This time we're going back to Detective Comics with a three-part story that takes its cues from Assault on Precinct 13 and The Warriors, going from Detective Comics issues 654 to 656. These three issues are written by Chuck Dixon with pencils by Michael Netzer and Tom Mandrake and are inked by Scott Hanna with colors by Adrian Roy, lettering by John Costanza, and are edited is edited by Scott Peterson and the legendary Denny O'Neill. We open with Batman fighting a very 80s-ass looking street gang, while some really great narration describes Batman from an opponent who seeks to destroy him, one who is not Bane. I've heard of him. Who hasn't? I thought he was an urban myth, like albino alligators and the choking Doberman, the kind of thing you read about in tabloids. But he's real. A fighting man of the city streets. A dark knight. The rooftops and alleyways are his battlefields. Often he is without allies. Always he is outnumbered. Always he is unarmed. Always he is victorious. A true knight. A true warrior. I believe the adage that a man is judged by the strength of his enemies. That would make Batman a fearsome foe by any measure. And all the more glory to me when I destroy him. Our narrator is Ulysses Hadrian Armstrong, who was sent to military school by his parents and where he was bullied, while also having a strong, very strong affinity for military history and the generals of the past. All of this lasted until Armstrong locked his classmates in their dorm and torched the buildings to fake his death in the process. Yeah, there's no getting around this. Um, our antagonist here has a very high body count by the end of the story and starts pretty seriously with, you know, torching his military school dorm. Possibly killing everyone inside, it's not made clear. It is made clear that Armstrong doesn't care how many people he killed when he did this. In short, in our modern age of school shooting, there might be some pause in putting this particular story out due to this element of the story. I'm not saying they wouldn't do it, but they'd stop and think about it for a bit and maybe give a few more passes on the uh, writing for here. In any case, from there, Armstrong went to Gotham and learn earns the respect of a local gang by organizing the theft of weapons and equipment from a National Guard armory. And in the process of the robbery, they also kill the he also kills the leader of the gang in order to take control Oh, did I mention this kid looks like he's 10? Well that, that's, well, that is because he's 10. Oh, and to cap this off, he personally kills the guards at the armory. At GCPD, Commissioner Gordon and Batman confer on the robbery, with their only lead being the gang member who has left at the scene. Meanwhile, Armstrong has thought of that, as far as people tracing them back to their hideout because of the gang member they left behind. So he's had the gang change locations, and is also having cha them change their colors for military uniforms, through what I think is a fundamental misunderstanding of the purpose of colors. Gang colors, this isn't just like, you know, st street gang, this is biker gangs and similar groups. They have the colors not just out of a sense of shared identity, but also through as a way to project that identity openly in a manner that allows for a degree of self-expression without in a way that doesn't have them be uniform cogs in a machine. I mean, that is part of the whole point of boot camp is to, is to a degree to strip away a sense of individuality and to force someone to one to accept being a part of the larger group. And this is also done in a way that is coded to allow members to pass among people who aren't part of that culture without their knowledge, and also to communicate their affiliation to those who are in the know. And whereas doing uniform is, is to communicate to everyone without question that you are part of a shared organization, and what that to a degree what that organization is. Now, as part of this, they are chaining the name of their gang, based on a Shakespeare quote that Armstrong dropped, to the War Dogs, and Armstrong gets his nickname, the General. In any case, in the wake of the robbery, Renee Montoya and Harvey Bullock are now checking on the 8th Avenue OGs. The War Dogs' former name was the Bengal Raiders, and the 
dead gang member, being former leader of that group, leads Montoya and Bullock to suspecting that perhaps, well, if the OGs were responsible for this, because the Raiders had done work for the for the uh, OGs, they might let something slip. Not so much in the sense of, oh, outright saying, yes, we ordered this, no, we didn't, We're, but in the sense of, oh, we heard something. Batman has the same idea and is following on the rooftops. All three arrive just in time for the War Dogs to roll up in their stolen Humvees, welding automatic weapons as they gun down the OGs. Armstrong has changed his look as well, having gotten his hair cut in a fade with a general stars shaved out of the sides. Batman takes down two of the War Dogs while the gang rolls through, totaling Montoya and Bullock's vehicle in the process. As they leave, Armstrong reflects on having seen Batman in, in action in the process, and is, he's impressed by his skill. Also, Montoya sees a trail of blood going around the corner, implying that Batman caught a bullet. This is confirmed in the Batcave as Alfred tends to Batman. Apparently the War Dogs are using armored-piercing bullets, which are erroneously described as Teflon-coated. Bruce tells Alfred that Stim Tim is staying off of this one, at least until he gets a handle on what's going on. Elsewhere, the OGs have arranged to meet with the War Dogs. The OGs have also had a change in management under similar circumstances to how the Raiders became the War Dogs. The General gives his offer. The OGs join the War Dogs, but keep their colors as a unit insignia. He lays out his plan. Unite the gangs, crush the mobs and, mobs and the police, and the Bat. The second issue begins with Batman keeping watch on the Raymond Rudolph projects, as he suspects that this will be the next front of the war. He's not wrong, as the war dogs hit the place next, with Batman jumping in the middle. During the fray, the leader of the Runners, the gang that controls the projects, manages to capture the General. Batman saves him from certain deaths when he plummets from the building, as the war dogs gun down the Runners' leader, Bojack. Batman, not knowing who he saved, turns his back on the General, who immediately clobbers him over the head with a, uh, appears to be some rebar with some concrete on the end, knocking him from a fire escape to the ground several stories below. The general taunts Batman as he leaves him for dead, allowing Batman to get back to the Batmobile and return to the Batcave without his knowledge. That night, the general rallies his troops in a scene that would almost be evocative of Cyrus's speech from the warriors, if it wasn't for the increasingly fascist trappings of the general's costume, including his M. Bison, slash Lord Vega, slash Dictator, depending on how you're calling this in the Street Fighter scene, esque hat. With the other gangs consolidated and Batman down, Black Mask's gang is next, or rather would be, if the two members of the False Face Society that the War Dogs had captured didn't spill that Black Mask is still missing after faking his death after his confrontation with Batman. So, with him off the list, it's and time for the next target, the GCPD. The next day, Bruce goes undercover as a homeless guy, and through eavesdropping and also beating up two gangers who try to rob him for his empties, he gets the street name of the general and the location of their base. That night, Batman comes in on the Batmobile like the wrath of God. Except nobody's home, and all that the war dogs have left are the two dead false faces and a tactical map of the area are on the 43rd Precinct Police Station. The final issue of this arc begins as the General's laying siege to the 43rd Precinct, starting with cutting the phones and power, and then taking out the radio tower with a rocket launcher. The order is given to go in, and take no prisoners. The police try to hold out as Batman comes roaring in through the War Dog's perimeter. Albert's a two-fold diversion, as Batman is operating the Batmobile from a rooftop by remote control. First, it's being done as an attempt to divert some of the General's troops into pursuing the Batmobile to reduce pressure on the precinct. Second, it's being done to confirm the General's identity to find out who's giving the orders to have the troops redirect. The former is a failure, as the General recognizes that it's a feint. But the latter is a success, as Batman gives, sees the General giving orders and is taken aback by him being a kid. The general and his men manage to get into the building and burst into the impound room to seize drugs and money to fund their war efforts, along with grabbing additional guns. This distracts them, allowing Batman to strike. 
General tries to get his men and stand and fight, repeating that Batman is only one man! A cry that works exactly as well from him as it uh, has for numerous other gang bosses um, and other members of the rogues gallery for many times in the past. The general's men rout, and the general himself is forced to flee with what is either actual or feigned helplessness, probably a combination of the two. He makes it to a rooftop across the street where he starts plotting his return to power before being very quickly captured and trussed up by Batman, who leaves him for the police. And the police are informed by the members of the War Dogs that they were being led by a child under the age of 18. And watching all of this is Bird. Bird returns to Bane to report, and they decide that Black, Black Mask and the General were a inadequate demonstration of Batman's skills. To push Batman harder, to bring him closer to the edge, they only need to put him against more ambitious enemies. There is a brief interstitial page after this where we very briefly meet the General's family, and we get what's meant to be a darkly comic sitcom interlude, but it doesn't work given the circumstances and the number of dead that the General was responsible for. That morning, Alfred comes to bring Bruce breakfast and finds him collapsed, exhausted, wearing the bat suit in the chair next to the bed. This storyline is basically twofold. It shows that mental exhaustion is starting, starting, to build up on Bruce, and more importantly, it reintroduces Bane to the equation. Bane is clearly deliberately laying low to build up intelligence and other information for his ultimate plan, which we have yet to see, but his appearance here builds up a definite sense of threat, that he is here in the background and he has been manipulating events to a certain extent. What extent and to what ultimate goal we, at this point, are yet to know, of course, us in the present day, we know where this is going. Now, as far as the general himself goes, he is an interesting threat here. On the one hand, he would probably he would probably have problems when it comes to the rest of Batman's rogues gallery, not just the Joker, um, another more malicious and homicidal threats. I mean, he has no qualms with killing on his own, but up against Scarecrow, Joker, even possibly Two Face, things get could get bad for him. However, the strong implication here in the story is that most of the rogues are currently safely locked up in Arkham, and while they may be escaping in ones and twos, like what happened with Black Mask, they're generally more manageable now for Batman, and for that matter, GCPD, which also gives something of an opening for someone as opportunistic as the General. Now, the General on his own is going to become not within the scope of Nightfall itself, but in the larger world of the Bat family, more of a recurring antagonist of Tim Drake as Robin. And I think, actually, for if that was the long-term goal with him starting here, introducing him in a story where Robin is absent and putting him directly against Batman actually works in his favor, because it shows him as an th antagonistic threat, as someone who's going to... Who, poses something of a challenge to Batman, though Batman is ultimately able to overcome him, and not a physical challenge, a mental challenge, a strategic challenge. Um, but he's not so much of a heavy hitter that he should exclusively be part of Batman's rogues gallery. This also creates a situation where the general could theoretically, again, outside of night, the scope of Nightfall, team up with another bat, more larger Batman antagonist, and create a person who, a opponent who both Batman and Robin have a history with. And not just in the sense of Batman has a history with this guy, Robin has a history with the general. They've both, they've interacted with both opponents. So, it's, he's a good fit there. Next time, Azrael flies with the Bat family.
thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.